Okay, great. So welcome everyone, those who are here in person and uh, online. Um, it's great to see you all. I uh, think we have, yeah, we have like 60 people online. So a lot of people, but weather's not very good. So. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much for joining us this afternoon at our Population Health Spotlight uh, talk. And today we're very fortunate to have Laura Maraña, who is um, uh, president and CEO, CEO of ASPPH, which you have heard about, I'm sure, Associations of Schools and Programs of Public Health. She's been in that role since 2017. Um, and really, I think Laura has brought a lot of new energy and ideas to the organization, those of us who attend the many activities that the ASPPH organizes for students and programs of public health have really, um, you know, since that, and especially it's been great to see that, um, uh, especially also during COVID. I think everything you guys did during COVID to keep us all engaged was really, really important. Among many other initiatives that she's launched, you know, new initiative through the data, uh, public health research through the data center, which we all have consult for important information. Um, the Academic Public Health Leadership Institute, uh, which I, I think also has been uh, a great initiative. Um, also increasing the advocacy role of ASPPH to be broader advocacy around public health and not just around what schools need, but around public health issues more generally, which is something that many folks in the organization have been asking uh, for, and that's been that's been great. And also, I think uh, I also want to highlight that she's really brought you know a more global vision to public health, um, and you know reaching out to global partners and um, and leading to the creation of the global network for academic public health, which I think is also so important given how global public health is. Um, and she's also launched five strategic initiatives, which I just want to mention because they all address very critical issues in public health that are that we have also been thinking about a lot. Um, dismantling racism in academic public health, of course, uh, climate change and health, uh, a new framing the future the Future 2030, which is helping us, I'm sure we'll talk about some of this in terms of thinking about, you know, what we should, how, what we should be training students to know and do. Um, gun violence prevention and the ASPPH Workforce Development Center. So very important initiatives, I think, that are critical to the mission of all schools and programs and all of academic public health. And before joining ASPPH, Laura was uh, involved in many activities that had to do with public health, uh, public and private universities in Mexico, educational and organizations in the United States, United Nations programs, non-governmental organizations. And right before joining, she was Dean of the School of Public Health at the um, uh, Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública, ISP, uh, which we actually have many colleagues and collaborators in. So that's good. So, very nice. So thank you so much, Liza. Great to host you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much, all of you, because we have been having the whole morning a lot of uh, meetings and just chat with all of you. It has been just great to be back in the school environment. I love to be in the school environment. Although I work in an office right now, but uh, it, it's just great, the, the, you know, the environment of uh, the university of us. So what I was thinking of, about uh, sharing this morning, and I hope we have really enough time to, for a chat and a Q&A at, at the end, is just to start talking about maybe three main things. One is that we need to realize in terms of we are in a higher education institution, we're in a, in a university, and right now, especially last year, there's a lot of uh, really great documents and reports that came out globally in order to really call for action to the universities themselves. And because the schools of public health are under that uh, umbrella, let's talk about what what is what is a call for the universities right now in this historical moment, just to frame our conversations. And then we're gonna go to talking a little bit more specific about COVID and what we learned from COVID and specifically as an accelerator for educational transformations. And then at the end, of course, I'm gonna be talking more particular about education for public health, more thinking about really reimagining education for the future. And I'm sure a lot of those things you are already thinking about that, you're really 
in the vanguard of a lot of the great ideas that I really congratulate that this, this is cool. So let's start with the challenges, the, the bigger umbrella, the, the, the higher education institutions. And of course, we all know, right, that humanity is facing unprecedented challenges. Just talking about climate change, loss of the nature and biodiversity, as well as inequality, health, economy. So given this new reality in which the future of humans and actually other species as well is really at stake, it is time for higher education institutions really to systematically rethink their role in society and reflect on how they can really serve as a catalyst for a rapid, urgently needed, and fair uh, transitions and transformations that our planet will require. So uh, in 2022, that year, UNESCO released a seminar report on how to transform higher education for global sustainability. That I really encourage, encourage all of you to read it. There has to be a lot of material there. And it's really an urgent call for action for universities around the world. Higher education institutions are uniquely positioned to contribute to the social, economic, and environmental transport <laughs> that are required to tackle really the world's most pressing issues through achieving the sustainable development goals. And yes, I'm, I'm sure all of you know this, but these are <laughs> development uh, goals. They are really will ensure us a sustainable planet and our really our human existence. So with 2030 less than a decade away, it is paramount to think critically and act urgently if we are to achieve these goals to respond to the global challenges facing humanity and the planet. So transformation in higher education institutions is a red thread running through all the social, uh, through all the SDGs, uh, the, 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 the development of those, which will require really radical shifts in the current developmental par paradigms that are exacerbating inequalities and really jeopardizing our common existence and our common future. So this transformation is dependent on new knowledge, research, and new competencies that only higher education institutions can provide, rooted in their historic role of service to society. So it's not enough to merely recognize the role of higher education, but essentially, to look at what really stands in the way for these institutions to contribute significantly to a fair, more human, democratic, inclusive, and peaceful future for all. So UNESCO urges to reorient existing education programs to include more, more aspects related to sustainability. And it is in three pillars specifically, more about society, more about environment, and more about the economy. Sustainability is a way of understanding just life together. It's living with nature and the environment in a global uh, world. So it is important for the universities retain that the universities retain their position as arenas for developing and vetting critical ideas like basic research and education and freedom of thought. However, it's crucial that they strengthen their role now as providers of knowledge and solutions in order to play a key role in the global agenda. Through exploring and explaining the risks to societies and the natural environments, advising on remedies and engaging in sort of transformations. So this calls for a radical new mode of inter and interprofessional action in research and education. A matrix uh, in which new horizontal structures and platforms add to the vertical one that we often have. We often have silo-like structures of faculty and their departments. So it also calls for much more active outreach and community engagement, providing science advice for policy and extended networking and alliances, while at the same time we approach in society with an open attitude, really willing for, for a dialogue. So what are the I'm sorry, I don't know if you can see that. So what are the really the global trends in terms of higher education? What is it all the universities around the world they need to really advance on? So the COVID-19 pandemic has reshaped our lives around, around more online and remote modes of living, 
working, studying, playing. So we have discovered the benefits of being able to do things from anywhere. And our appetite for online and remote options as consumers is likely to persist. So across many institutions, the emergency remote teaching most adopted through the pandemic will give really way to more sustainable and evidence-based models of hybrid and online teaching and learning to support these really, really longer term consumers forever. As institutional leaders uh, plan for enhanced resources and infrastructure in support of the new hybrid and online programs, they will need to focus on developing sound hybrid, hybrid and online pedagogies and investing in additional staff and services in the areas of instructional design and faculty development. Institutions must also be prepared to train and support their students in effectively engaging with and making the most of these new learning environments, with a particular focus on the needs of the non-traditional students. So expectations and demands for non-credit and non-traditional education and skills-based training are on the rise. Students and lifelong learners will be paying closer attention to these more practical, personalized, and skills-based courses and micro-credentials as potentially more attractive opportunities for advancing their careers than the traditional college degrees. Major technology companies are really removing even the four-year degree requirements from their jobs uh, postings and choosing to focus instead on the actual skills and competencies job candidates are bringing with them to the work. So these changes sign up to institutions and need to realign education and business. More models to better fit this consumer, this consumer and industry trends and to develop more attractive and flexible skills-based courses and credentialing, talking about this this morning, options for educating, training, risk, risk skilling, and upskilling the current and the future world. <laughs> so the campus of the future will need to be completely redesigned to meet more needs and ever, than ever before. Campus leaders will, be, will need to really account for new challenges, such as accommodating remote learners and workers, integrating foundational accessibility needs for all, and addressing new green initiatives for a sustainable uh, campus. I'm going to end this, this part, this first part, by saying that uh, the higher education institutions must consider three areas of transformation. Number one, they need to move towards inter and transdisciplinary uh, education, it's, it's a must. Knowledge and accumulation, uh, of, 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 um, knowledge accumulation, logic followed by many uh, of our universities, leads to overemphasized theoretical tasks and downplay practical issues and real-world problems. But we need to include more problem-based learning and research. Number two, the imperative need for institutions to become open, fostering epistemic dialogue and integrating other ways of knowing. Learning can be enhanced, enhanced when accompanied with search objectives like action research, and when social participants are included like participatory research. The successful local development should be scaled up to really influence policy. And number three, the demand for a much stronger presence in society, in general, through proactive outreach activities and, part and partnering with other societal actors. Higher education institutions must play a much more dominant role in society as a whole and the different sectors that compose it, like government, private sector, civil society, social organizations, and of course, communities. They must democratize knowledge, strengthen their outreach and directed toward advocacy for change and transformation and toward social impact. So I end with this quote that says that only by following an inter and transdisciplinary approach can sustainable development education be able to confront the problems that are cross that cross traditional disciplines and involve multiple stakeholders and occur in multiple scales. So if life, if the workforce is like that, we need to start training our, all our students in these very same uh, So that was like the umbrella. That's what 
what's happening in the higher education as a whole and what that I mean they ask and they call for an urgency transformation of our universities as a whole. But then let's just look more specifically about some of these issues, but now from a, a different perspective, like learning from COVID-19, because some of the changes that we saw that we started to, to see in the universities actually COVID just accelerated them. So the very first one uh, is, is about public health. It's about um, the content that we really teach. So during the pandemic, our understanding of health really was challenged. So we all know that the health system and the health professionals and education were concentrated just on healthcare and not paying much attention to the conditions where people live, play, work that make them sick or healthy in the very first place. And COVID showed us once again that these very same conditions worsen in front of a crisis. So because the population that are most vulnerable are the ones that pay the highest consequences. So for years, public health has really advocated to be the, a central content in all health professionals' education. And even beyond that, not just the health professionals, but starting with our own family. And, and I think that until now, until after COVID, they are a little bit more open to put more content of public health, population health into their own curriculum, because it was that was exactly what uh, what the COVID showed us, or one of the things that they showed us. Uh, a second point is that COVID nineteen also highlights long standing, of course, inequalities in the health system in the United States, in the United States and around the world. So just here, you all know that compared with white and non-Hispanic people, minorities in particular, Hispanics, Blacks, and, and indigenous people, uh, they have experienced more than one and a half times the case rate, three times the hospitalization rate, and two times the death rate. So to fully understand health disparity, the use and collection of accurate and updated data from all our schools, research, and health indicators regarding social determinants of health is needed to understand and eradicate health disparity while improving health community uh, interventions. So strengthening the health system also requires a greater focus on solidarity and redistribution of social potential uh, protection systems to address underlying structural inequalities, racism, and poverty. So we know that despite much talk of the importance of health promotion, even across the richer always city uh, countries, 33% of the total health spending is devoted to prevention. So lesson two is like acting in the social determinants uh, is really unforeseeable to advance in the health equity and that will require a significant increase in the budget allocation really to the sectors that really influence uh, people's health. Number three, also COVID um, uh, show us again that a single discipline uh, working in isolation would not be able to address complex planetary and social challenges. So there's another quote here about the need for multidisciplinarity, a need to interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. We need to do more collectively among all the programs, not just the health professional programs, but also with social engineering, business and architects and others in order to bring uh, knowledge together and together really think differently about how to uh, to solve the, the, the solutions and the biggest uh, challenges. Another thing that happened during, during COVID, very interesting for us in public health, is that we were really visible. For the first time, people started to think about public health, to know what public health is, and to really even use, you know, uh, language or words that it was very into our own just uh, language because they, they, they understood what happened, right? So more than ever, uh, public health was very visible uh, during these two years and uh, these three years. And we really need to take advantage of that because actually we are starting in a phase of declining our visibility. And we should be very aware that what we really want to do is how can we capitalize in what just happened and how can we continue to be very uh, visible? Now, the interest in public health has, has grown not just from COVID, which we're gonna look right now, but actually during the last like 20 years, 
you know, degree in conference has really uh, increased a lot, like 300% uh, in the last 20 years. The same is true for the schools and programs of public health. We have really grown a lot in the last 20 years. But what happened during the pandemic that we were so busy with that, the impact on the number of applicants in the day and the year of the pandemic, at the end of that year, the first year, we had an increase of 40% in applicants, in, like in general. You know, the sad thing is that this statistic is coming down, of course, is decreasing, and now we are in the same position as uh, the one year before the pandemic. So that has to tell us that we really need to be, to keep on being more visible in fully health because, you know, the momentum just passes and we're going to, you know, take advantage of the momentum and we're going to be, again, uh, doing that, that the same, the same thing. Now, two other things are happening in the field of, uh, of public health that should give us away our schools and programs in terms of the need for public health professional. One is the retirement uh, uh, percentage of our or rate of our uh, people who are working in public health. This is the statistic is actually even before, one year before the pandemic. And already we knew that 41% of people in public health is going to be retiring in the next years. Now, if we add the effect of the pandemic, of course, this, this number increased. So we have a lot, of, we already had, you know, uh, the need for more people, but with, the, with, the, with this resignation, it was really, it, it's even higher the need of our students that are allowed to really fulfill these and more of the positions in public health. Another important fact is that from the people who are uh, in the, working right now in public health, only 14% of them are trained in public health. So the need to train all these people, and these are the only the ones who are already in the workforce. Something that's happening right now is that because of the money that the government is given to hire new people, most of these new people they don't have this public health. So we have these people here, and then we have the new the new people that it's higher and been higher, and who's already training them? How are we already training them? Are we expecting that they're gonna come for a master's degree? And I'm gonna talk a little bit deeper uh, in that regard. So the shortage of public health really personal is really is really is really growing. So uh, the message here after the pandemic is that we must seize the moment. So now is the time to really think and rethink and to transform the educational system in order to really uh, construct and build back uh, better. We really want and need a better system in the future in order to really uh, continue our education and really able to to meet the needs of, and the challenges of the children and the future uh, of our planet and uh, the humans. So let me talk now, uh, this third part, about just specifically about one of the things that we should be doing in, in education in public health in order to really meet these challenges. Now, let me tell you that these, some of these things or some of these changes, uh, we're going to be talking about these, you know, several years or even decades, just because the drivers were three things. First of all, the changes in the market. There's a new market. Uh, the, the, the jobs are changing, are evolving. Uh, and that was uh, really forcing us to be looking at the workforce in order to see what are the competencies that we need to be you know, uh, teaching in our schools and programs. But then also the advances on the cognitive uh, area in the sense that now we know how the adults learn, what are the best ways to educate adults. So I think that that also uh, was a good driver for changing our curriculum so the way we, we teach. Uh, and of course, the advances in technology, that now we have more accessibility to different uh, tools and technology that help support education. But definitely, of course, the pandemic really forces, of course, us to really think more quickly uh, those changes. So I'm going to touch very quickly in two different, 10 different areas that we can at least start thinking about uh, the field of public uh, health. The very first one is that a lifelong learning approach, meaning that we cannot think now anymore that we're going to have one student for one time because that student is coming for their master or the undergrad or the certificate and it's going to go to work and we forget about the students. That's not going to be the case in the future. We need to think that we're going to have lifelong learners 
that they're going to come to us, hopefully, <laughs> to us, like uh, to, to study, to be a study, to do it all the process of all their lives. Why? Because the life is changing constantly. It's constantly changing the, the, the competencies. If you are learning a lot of new competencies, maybe what I'm saying right now, in two or three years, it's not going to be uh, true anymore because it's changing. Yeah? We need to have that reality. So our schools interest, have, interest how our profession started as a graduate profession, and then we build the undergraduate, and a lot of our schools are now in, the, in this business, the undergraduate and the graduate, and that, that's good. The third um, like area that most of our schools and programs are thinking is offering, of course, in the workforce, and there is really a trend to do much more in actually this third circle. Uh, because this is, this is our space. This is the space of the schools of process of health. We need to talk about, yes, master's degree, doctoral degree, but also what are we doing with undergrad education? What are we doing with community college in terms of, of, of content in public health? And of course, the lifelong learners, they're gonna be with us all the time. So I think that there are two things that has to happen if, if that's our scope of work. And is there that our institutions need to be more open in order to readmit students every time they need to a new skill or new skills of, of competencies? What are the models that we are offering in order for them that are working to come and do that? But also the workforce, the work the labor, uh, the, the working environment has to change in order to allow their employees to go back and go back to school in order to really uh, acquire these new competencies. And a challenge that we have actually from COVID, and I really encourage our schools to actually start influencing, we need to influence education from kindergarten uh, to K-12 in order to be really in the future, what do we want? What we want citizens, educated citizens that they take good care of themselves about their health and their well-being. And in order to do that, we need public health 101 in the curriculum all over since so that's just a pending, uh, I would say, a pending task that we all have the duty to start moving us along and trying to influence the curriculum in, in those areas. So that was number one. Number two, we used to have a tunnel, or we used to have a tunnel vision of education in our programs, regardless of what, what way, meaning that. The children's vision is because we have common experiences for everyone, same entry requirements for everyone, same graduation requirements for everyone. But if we think that we're gonna have uh, these lifelong learners, so the first assumption is not true anymore. We don't have common, common students. I mean, everyone is gonna come with different experiences, with different ages, with different needs. So we need to start thinking about what would be the requirements for specific programs or for specific learners in order to entry our, our system. So we need to start thinking about more like kaleidoscopy, meaning that we need to start thinking about developing unique experiences for individual students. That's what we're gonna have, like individual people that's gonna come to us with multiple entries and multiple exits. And just to understand why, why we, we are so common in our tunnel vision, uh, I, I want you to think about like education is the only field, the only one in the whole life that is so hard to change. So education like 50 years ago, it was done like that, you know, like everyone studying the same thing, doing the same curriculum because we used to have a national economy and industrial economy. Where of course all the tasks are done. Right? So it was it was very similar to you know this industry where you know everything there everything all of them are doing the same things at the same time, they entry, they you know they, they exit at the same time, they are with common things. But the industry changed. The current at the moment right now is more about information, it's about digital, it's it's global, it's not about processes, it's really about results. So the, so the industry is right now more aware or more concerned about result approach and timing and processes vary. Depends, you wanna do it at home, do it at home. I just need this to be done, right? You wanna do it three days as opposed to one day. Just do it, but I need this to be done. So there was a change in the world 
but education didn't get it. Didn't get that change. So that's why we still, like we were in the national economy, you know, doing everybody the same thing. So this is just like for all of us to be aware of why we were like that, like that but how we need to be changed. So if we think that we may then need to change in terms of having a more flexible curriculum, we need to, to start thinking about uh, instead of having a static curriculum, these are the list of material that you need to take, you should think about what the competence that, that you need to reach. So then what is the courses that you need to take? So as opposed to just being in the curriculum for this particular grade. So the other thing that's also we to start thinking about is uh, maybe <coughs> making uh, time variable education. Because if we think about competencies and think about maybe a, a certificate program that we, yeah, we were talking this morning about that. So if the individuals are different and they have different needs and different times, maybe we all need different times to learn things, right? Maybe I need you know, 10 hours to learn something and maybe another one would need three hours or 20 hours. So the important thing is that we all need to have that competence. Why don't we have different times uh, for the learners to learn the time they need, you know, to really master the competencies? So we need to start thinking about that. Another big change is that uh, that we, of course, in public health, but again, we already get it, is that instead of just thinking about content and knowledge and that thing that you need to know. We're thinking about competence. Why? First of all, something that I, I already said, 50% of the current jobs will disappear. So what are we training our students for? I'm training our students right now for something that maybe when they finish or in the next five years, it's going to disappear. So did they waste their time here? Well, I were, we were you know, uh, just talking about knowledge. But what about if we talk about competence? If we talk about competence, is that something that you can transfer? that you can really generate. So it doesn't matter that I have a, a, a work right now, but tomorrow I'm changing my, my, my position, my work, and I'm going to be able to apply those knowledge because I have the competencies to do that. As opposed to if I have the knowledge and my work disappears, it's like, oh my God, now I don't know what to do, how to do this, because I was just a knowledge-based person. That doesn't mean that we don't need knowledge. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But what it means is that we need to change our concept of curriculum because it's just not about, not about, not just about knowledge, but about the competencies that we need in order to be able to do these other things. And, and if you very quickly see the list of just competencies randomly that I just put here, look at none of them are related to really knowledge, but are competencies important for life right now that it would be useful for students to have? Like, for example, use effectively big data evidence-based problem solver, critical and creative thinker, used to be digital and technical savvy, culturally agile, learning to learn because they need to be keeping learning, agile, flexible, salient, uh, et cetera. So there's a couple of ways that are more uh, to see competences. And, then, and I know that's a topic that we all talk in our, in our uh, schools because it's just a requirement, right? So, but I would like you to really encourage you to think about uh, competencies as being uh, also, you know, possibilities and opportunities for our students to really keep on growing. So, there's, this is one way, just one way to see the category, the competencies to, to see that, like in categories. For example, we can talk about foundational competencies. Of course, all of our students need foundational competencies and the foundational competencies. A lot of time, of course, our theories, our hypotheses, are things that they need to learn, of course. Uh, we, we know that also we have specialized competencies that depending on the job, if you're an epi, you're a bio, or a uh, uh, specialist. But then we have the interactive competencies, which are, those are the ones in this, in this model and in another one that I'm gonna show you, that I really want you to pay attention a little bit more because the foundational and the specialized competency is like we already know. I mean, we know what that, that, how those, those those look like in our own course. But the interactive competencies are the ones that are making our students to be more to integrate knowledge and to be able to really do other things, more complex capabilities. And actually, also these these interactive competencies deals with leadership.
skills as well that we need to integrate more in our curriculums. So we're thinking about critical thinking, emotional intelligence, uh, teamwork, ethical deliberation, communication, very important. So the same way in this one, this is another way of seeing uh, the, the competencies. It, actually, uh, this is one of my favorites because it's very visual that in my curriculum, I really need to pay attention that I, I need to have not just the technical and specialized, I look at it there, we have to have that, but we also are very much into the social and emotional and the cognitive and the level. As long as our curriculum has, you know, the three of these, you know, in, during the semester of the, 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 the yearly, uh, we, we're doing fine. We're doing really a good job with, with our students. So in the cognitive and metacognitive, what are we talking about? Just examples, creativity, autonomy, strategic and critical thinking, um, to be the ability to be agile, to be uh, curiosity, in the social and emotional, some examples, empathy, collaboration, resilience, respect, appreciation for diversity, reconciliation, respect. And in the technical and specialized, of course, it's more about uh, you know, the choice or the fundamental uh, knowledge in every single of our professions. So we must equip our students uh, for the world that is going to be built. The future is not here yet. And the future is nothing that we say, oh, in the future, we build the future. We, we need to build what we want our students to be able to do like in that, in that future. So it doesn't matter how many times, and the research said that, that usually right now our students change 11 times uh, jobs. So it doesn't matter that they change so many times the job, but if they have the appropriate competencies, which deal more in the cognitive and metacognitive, like the social, emotional, they're going to be fine, like, like uh, in the future. So in order to develop those competencies, there are other things in the school that has to change. It's interesting to see, and these are pictures from a classroom in 1920 and a classroom in, in 2010 or could be now, the 2020 classroom. It's actually the same. So the classroom has not changed in a hundred years. It's like, can you imagine if our cars haven't changed in a hundred years or our telephones or, you know, we will leave. So it's just, it's just almost incredible that education has not really changed a lot. And of course, that this classroom or this traditional style of, of, of teaching and learning will not get the competencies that our students uh, uh, need. What we need to do, that is another point, is we need to embrace the blended moments. Now that we like it or not, I know that. And, and I was like in 2006, already taking up an online education, and everybody, all the time, was like, I'm a new person. We cannot do that online, blah, blah, blah. But now it's just like, it's, it's not an option. You know, like, oh, do, do I need to do online or I mean, we better embrace technology is here to stay. And it's for the better. We need to just embrace it. We need to embrace that there are some things that are so good to do it online. Example, I have some examples here. For example, Really, online education facilitates the technical foundational or the theories. Instead of me talking here about the theory, these, they did, well, let the students study that online. They can read others or they can uh, see videos from other people, even you know, explain better what the theories are. So they can do that perfectly online, all the, all the technical foundational uh, competencies. Now, what they can't do online, or I'm not, not at the best. There are some things that, of course, it's better to be in person. So that's why the, you know, the title of this is embracing both. I think that both models are really great for learning. There are some great online things that we can use and learn, but, but we need the in person. Now, when I think we need in person, we need in person, but not to do the traditional things, uh, just to come and just listen to a, to a person. We really need to facilitate like the social, the emotional, the professional and cognitive competence it can be developed better in, a, in, a, in an in-person uh, facility. But the in-person facility has to change. And I'm not talking about automation because what some institutions see, oh, let's bring everybody their computers to this room. And by doing that, we're not changing and we're just bringing the computers to the, to the classroom. So this is just a, 
I picture that. It's not about automation because if you, we, everybody has here their computer, maybe one person is paying attention because the others, what are they doing? They're checking email, they're browsing social media, they are browsing the news, they have pictures of land we can, or even they are working their assignments for another, another class. So who knows what they're doing, right? So that's not transformation, that's automation. We just bring digitally, you know, the computers. So what we do when we bring the computers to the classroom, is we are just perpetuating, you know, the status quo. The very same thing that we're doing a hundred years. So what we really need is innovation and transformation, because innovation and transformation really challenges the status quo. So the key is here. So it doesn't matter that you're online or in presence, because you can be distracted online and in presence. It's the same thing. It's not that because you're here, you know, pay more attention. That's not true. It's just exactly the same online or in presence. What's the difference? If you're engaging with students, that is the key to the transformative education. So really, instead of fighting so much of how much online, how more online, we need to really engage in conversations about how can we engage our students online or in presence in the education? Because that is the key. We need to be more engaging and more active in case studies or project-based learning or experiential learning or teamwork discussions, learning by doing, you know, you name it. Everything related to the student engaging in their own learning. If he's not engaged, doesn't matter what, what the mode you're using, we're not gonna develop the, the competencies that we have. And I'm finalizing my presentation, but just a couple of other things. Something that you are already doing. We really need to start thinking beyond the degrees. So that mentality of our schools are that it's just a degree that we it's just that was great for the past. It's not great for the future. We will, of course, we will need a degree. But you know, doubting that we need to keep on doing our best for the degrees. But we need to start growing our uh, our goals of, 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 of education because people need all of this. Workforce needs. Digital certification, they need short online courses, they need micro credentials, they need intensive training one weekend, one week, and we really need to value uh, really experiential learning wherever it, uh, it, it occurs. So, if we're really doing all that, what about the faculty? I mean, we're so used to just, you know, uh, study my lesson and come here and just give my lecture, right? We, we have done that, you know, for years. So we need to start thinking about what are the new roles of faculty uh, and how can I'm going to train the faculty then in other you know, roles. Of course, faculty continues to be the key to all of this to succeed, but they need to do all the things. They need all the other skills. For example, they need to design learning scenarios because now it's not just coming me coming here and preparing my lecture and giving my lecture. I really need to, to be designing like how this individual will learn this content as opposed to the other individual or my online student or my in presence. So we are more designers of, of the learning experiences in order for the people to, for the students to really uh, develop their competence. We've got to be able to treat the students' performance through their professional careers. Can you imagine that? Instead of being mentor of my student here for one year or two years in the MPH, if that person is going to be like my, my, my long, long life learner here in my school, then maybe I'm gonna be assigned to one of those students that I want to, you know, to, to go with them for five, 10, 15 years and just guiding them and mentoring them in their what they need for the training. We need to be more like coaching the students in their in their ability to develop their competencies, mentoring more instead of lecturing because because we need to engage our students, so we need to avoid more lectures and, and do more mentoring. Of course, interpret performance dashboards in terms of how our students are developing their competencies, assess if they're ready, all of that. So faculty development is really uh, uh, you know, a, a big area in, in all of this. And the last thing is that we cannot keep on doing this ourselves in studies. Uh, you know, we have cycles in everything. Is just teaching and research? Is it uh, academic and practice? If it's under university, the faculty of medicine, the faculty of engineering. So everything that we do, it's, it's really silos. Well, at the very beginning, I was talking about if the community, if, if the problems in life that we need to solve are because we have the common perspectives. Why we are not doing that from the very beginning? So we really need to start talking more to our partners and alliances and 
and global and do more interactive uh, kind of work with our students, with other departments, with other areas, but with other partners uh, as well. So I end up by saying that public health education, I, I strongly believe, can be a leader in the innovation to improve the, the integration of emergency competencies, technologies, of course, and, and new models of doing things. So uh, I, I think that the future don't, doesn't just happen. We need to build it, and we need to build it with the principles that we know that what's going to be working for that for the future. So thank you. And maybe I talk a lot because I think that. Thank you. We have time for thank you. That was great. Thank you. It gave us a lot to think about. Um, and I think aligns with many things we've been thinking and talking about to at our school. So yeah. So we have time for questions. I don't know how it, online can people yeah, they can put stuff in the QA. Okay. Okay. So if you're online, you can uh, write your question in the QA and we'll we're monitoring and we will read it out. And uh, if you're here. Yeah. Hi, um, we've had a chance to meet already today, Jan over for international policy. I have a question about I'm really loud oh, because I don't know. Who. Yeah, thank you. I have a question about the micro credentials and all the other offerings. So academic institutions obviously are sort of built on this foundation of degrees and the money per credit unit. <laughs> and um, you know, in the environment they're in with facing uh, financial struggles. How have you seen people effectively use this in a positive way, not just for the learning side, but to be better uh, financially sustainable as an academic institution? Yes, very uh, good question. I think that the new, we are just starting to develop that area. A lot of our institutions are starting to, let's see, put, let's put together this certificate program, let's put together this credential, let's put together this. Uh, micro, even micro, master degree, and this and that. And because we are just starting, uh, I think that the next step is just to look at all of that and just put some, and we talked about this in this morning, a little bit of some guidance in order to do that. Because right now, the market is, you know, everyone is doing their own thing. So you can see credentials that are really long, and some of them are very small. There are more like very expensive, less expensive. So there, right now, the market is like, just starting to develop those things because they know that they need to really start doing that. But let me tell you that some of the universities that are already in that space, it's really a, 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 a revenue generating for the university. Because remember, we're talking with the workforce. We're training the workforce. So either the, the employers have the money to pay for those. It's like if you go to one of the companies, you know, you're workers, maybe you're a health provider or blah, blah, blah. So they need this certificate, right? And sometimes the employees pay uh, to the universities so that their employees uh, can, can be trained. So that's one thing, one, one more one thing. Others are more like, you know, uh, stand alone in terms of this is a certificate. So it's, a, it's really the worker that, oh, I need that skill and I'm gonna pay for that. And they pay for that because these are more like the, for the workforce, right? So there are some models that usually, even some, in, in some of the schools, they generate more money for the for the continued education part than for the degree granted part. So it's just a way of just starting to learn more about the business models that are you know people doing. But but for sure that's something that uh, that can be done with at least you know break even in terms of uh, yeah not losing by you know giving more certificates or more micro credentials. And I think that you write in the sense that we really the next step is just to start looking at those and trying to. Uh, not regulate them, but at least to put some parameters in terms of like the number of credits and what does that mean to the market. And the other thing I didn't talk today was that it's also our duty is just to inform the market about it. Just because the market right now is actually right now is even confused why we are training UG and MPH. So are they the same? Oh no, then I'm gonna try, I'm gonna bring in a UG because I'm gonna pay him less. So the market. It's a little bit confused about what are we doing? What are the competencies for an undergraduate versus a, a, a master's degree? And then if we've got to start by certifications or credentials, I think that if we don't do a good job with the market, informing them, like these are the you know the competencies or the skills that undergraduate or the jobs that they can do as opposed to a master's degree, as opposed to certificate. So I think those are areas 
opportunities for all of us to start moving up. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, and so one thing that, that I like that you highlighted between, you know, community college and undergrad, the traditional grad setting, and then the lifelong learners. Um, but I wonder if you could give us some of your thoughts on how to not have those types of learners be so siloed so that then we can create those like cross collaborations. Uh, which likely is going to be easier within a given university, right? But um, just I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts. No, it's very important, you know, because what happened with our profession, it was interesting. We started with a master, with a master degree. That's how we started. So we put there like the content, the content, blah, 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 blah. And then we said, oh, so the doctoral, there should be this and that. But then later on, they got all oh, the undergrad. Usually, the older professionals start just the opposite. It's just like this is the undergraduate for architects or where, and then it's the master. It's like the opposite. When you look, when you start with the, with the undergrad, it's easier because it's just like, okay, the knowledge goes of the competencies, goes onto this, and then the master's here and the doctor, right? Because we started the opposite has been a challenge because this is the master, which for all of us is like, this is our, uh, like, you know, main. Uh, you know, degree, right? And then from there, we said, okay, but if we're going to study undergraduate education, what's the difference? What are the competencies and the content? Even knowing that, for example, you have two students that, that come to undergraduate, one of them would go to the graduate school, and you want that student to start a master's degree and say, oh, I, I, I learned that in UG. Oh, I know that. I know that, right? But how about these students? But if you don't do that, how about these students that yes, go to to the youth, to the graduate school, but it's going to go to another one. You want that person to have more or less the general content of public health. So it's a challenge. But what we're doing, I mean, if you want to start a school you know, from scratch, it would be easier, right? Because you know, okay, undergrad education is this and going to be the competencies. And then graduate students are going to be this one. But if you don't go to this route, but all this other pathway is going to be the one and this other one. You need to have all of them in the same kind of, um, you know, Blackboard, don't you see, like, you know, uh, like, like the difference between them. But the challenge is that when you have, a, like, most of our schools, that they have our first this and then this and this, this. So, my recommendation, because, yes, it has to be in the same, in, uh, like, in the same view, holistic, in order to know, you know, what are the competencies uh, of an undergraduate, of the master, and also the workforce. If you put out a certificate or a micro credential, how does that compare to these? And what if you have a master's degree? Is that for them? Or is that for people who have nothing to do with public health? So there's a lot of questions that still to be asked, but the more holistic view you have, you know, from, from all the degrees that you are offering as a school, is the better. There's a, I know that you have the undergraduate under you, right? At the school of public health. Well, let me tell you, there, there are schools that the undergraduate education is in another school. Can you imagine the challenge there? It's like, okay, you have the UG, I don't know what you do with that, but my master do. So it's even, you know, it, 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 it's not good. But if you have the same perspective, the holistic with all of them, that's the better uh, way to do it, or to approach it. Pathways to lifelong learning include routes yes. that don't include or involve universities necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me personally, uh, uh, having been out in the practice domain, it's it's from going to annual meetings, conferences, engagements with with peers, or or even in house trainings. I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about where you see the niche of of the universities and the schools relative to that sort of broader set of resources that are there for people to learn from. Well, I think that uh, all the universities, because it is, this is, this, that's why I started with a higher education perspective, because this is, all, this is not happening only in public health or only in our uh, professional. It, this is a call, it's a major call. So that's why I think it's so important, because when, when, when a lot of people talk to you about the same things, you're like, okay, we need to pay attention, right? So higher education as a whole, global, is already talking about that. It's already talking about things that we have already talking to begin. Like for example, how to integrate more, how to do really more like uh, this integration of the curriculum with other professions. How can we do more, not just degree, because let's face it, 
even the degree right now is at stake. Now people is like, I don't even have to go to the university. It's just like I can do this and that, and then I, I can I can have this this job, right? Especially with the cost and all of that. So that's why a lot of the university, all the universities that I go to just think about it, about like, yeah, it's fun. There's always gonna be a place for degrees, but we need to think, you know, broader than that. And there is, you know, different, different like consortiums from the university levels, uh, nationally, globally, that are talking about this because this is a higher education conversation as well. And they are also thinking about how to implement see, from the university, the certificates, the micro credential, these other things. Because, because what happened like in 30 years ago, when the universities were not engaging in that, is that the industry started to do their own things. So it was like, you know, these, these you know, institutions that were more commercial, that they, you know, the automotive industry, oh, I'm gonna have my university because you are doing, doing a terrible job at universities and I wanna train my people. So they started to kind of, and they, what do they know about education, right? So that's why I think the university said to think like, oh, no, no, that's our business, not your business. So we need to start really broadening our scope. And all your, at least the universities are, 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 are called to really broaden their scope to the workforce development. And now with all the changes in the world, more and more, we all need to be thinking about how I'm gonna go back to, and, and could be an online training thing, like maybe 10 hours, but we all need in an everyday, like new, 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 new competence, new skill, because life is gonna continue to evolve uh, even more rapidly. So, yeah. So what, one of the competencies, for example, that we need to really stress in the education is the metacognitive in the sense that we, we want our students to, to learn, learn to learn by themselves. So it, I, don't have, I don't have to come to a university or a course. I really have to at least be aware that, okay, I need to, to, to know this competency and how do I look for it? How can I you know, develop that competency? And hopefully all of us, all our students and, you know, and then the workforce have that you know, uh, desire to continue. That's why we need to rethink the mentality of going to a course to a, no, no, I'm a, I'm a, I, I, I am a lifelong learner. Lifelong learner. So if I, I have the duty to continue my ability, you know, all my life. You got online? Yeah, go ahead. Online online questions. Questions. Let's switch a little bit to the research field. Okay. Um, oh, summarize this question. Uh, it says, as we continue to focus on interdisciplinary work and collaboration, one critique I've heard repeatedly from academic medical institutions that schools of public health tend to focus research more heavily on the problems and less on solutions and interventions. What can we as public health scholars and professionals do to be better collaborators when they're and push forth more than notion that academic public health research is more focused on barriers than solutions? I know we haven't talked a lot about research in your visit, but I don't get any thoughts. Right, but I, I, I don't really sure I would agree that most of our research is in the problem and not in the solution, just because we work so much in interventions and the communities. I don't know, I, I would, I don't know, I need to maybe study more about giving, study if our research, that the public health research is more heavily into the programs, because we think we need both. We really need to understand the problem, but the problem, we need to understand, and we are very good about that in terms of the, the data that we gather, and we need that. But it, but in what's taken, then we also need to go to the solutions. And I, I really remember at the very beginning of my talk, when I was talking about higher education, there is a great need and call for the university to focus more. This is the need, what are the solutions? We need to start thinking about solutions. Just think about climate change. Any of the topics that really we are in jeopardy as, 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 as a, a humanity, as a humanity, as a planet. So what are we doing about it in terms of understanding uh, the problem, but then getting to solutions. So I agree in the sense that we need to we need both. We need to integrate both. So there was, yeah. Yeah, can I ask? Yes. Yes, finally, my chance. Yes. So if I am, um, it's basically a question of, uh, of uh, an integrated dependency. And there's also uh, with regards to lifelong learning and process is very specific. Um, you know, to my situation, which is about, you know, the uh, mentors, mentoring the students for a lifetime throughout their career. I mean, uh, it's very interesting I ask you this question because I'm a uh, recent uh, PhD graduate from Dorset. So it's a, it's a really interesting sense, the transition. 
with the um, relationship with Vancouver just started. And I mean, the first half is doing the program, and then the second half is the, um, you know, how to keep a good relationship between the mentors and former students who actually foster that kind of things, you know, lifelong um, sort of mentoring or career mentoring. And, I mean, I know that's clearly an effort from both sides, uh, both mentor and the students, and this. Um, uh, I mean, it didn't speak to the relationship with the kids that I mean, the old time. So, um, I'm wondering what is your um, opinion about that? I and mean, any suggestions about fostering those relationships in the institutions of after students go out of um, those institutes. I mean, this is, I think this is very important, but I think it's probably an under atmosphere. Yeah. Um, I mean. No, I, I, and that's why at the beginning, uh, so this is an organic, this is a university's structural change, not just a school of OBI. I mean, we have our job to do, right? But if we really want to continue and hearing what, what is required of the university, really the structural university has to change. And having said that, it's gonna be very hard. It's gonna take a long time because again, education is very hard to change. It's just like, we take a lot of years. But if we really want to envision and we really need to have those relationships, this lifelong learning, it's just a completely different structure. What are the things that we need in order to really be mentors of two or three students, but for three years, not for one year, not two years, 20 years, right? How can I match you know, the, the good mentor with this particular person? But it's, so it's different, it's just different ways that we, we need to start thinking outside the box. That, that's the truth, right? Uh, and we don't have all the solutions, we just have like the envisioning, like the need to do something, but the way to do it, I think that we are, that's why we are learning. And, and, uh, and I love to be in, a, in the association that I am because I, I'm, I'm able to hear. This morning, I learned a lot. And, and, and I have a lot of feedback to things that we that need to happen. But if I go to second and third and, and 10 universities of our schools, then the collective knowledge is the one that's gonna make us move. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, there's popcorn and drinks out in the hallway. Pop, popcorn, pop out. <laughs>